Hi, this is Jeff Alpin, The Big Game Hunter. And if you're like me, finding a place to eat is never an easy thing to do. Whether you're in New York or D.C. or traveling, I always find myself wishing I had a trusted friend I could call to tell me where to have dinner or lunch or just where to eat. The infatuation is that friend. The infatuation helps you find the right restaurant for any situation. Need a place for a first date? Trying to find a spot for your birthday that you don't want to celebrate, except you kind of have to. I had that a couple of weeks ago, by the way. The infatuation has you covered in all these situations and many, many more. So if you need a place to eat, but don't want to read through thousands of unreliable crowdsourced reviews from imbeciles that you have no idea who they are, hit up the infatuation down hit up theinfatuation.com or download their free app for iOS or Android to search thousands of restaurant reviews and guides in 22 major cities around the world. Or let the infatuation do the work for you by sending a text to 64560. Again, that's text to 64560. A real person is going to respond to you and help you find a restaurant that's perfect for whatever situation you're in. Now, Let's get going. This is the No BS Coaching Advice Podcast, episode 110. I'm your host, Jeff Altman, the Big Game Hunter, and welcome. Weekly, I like to spend a little bit of time talking with you about life, the universe, everything. And today's show is a little bit different. Well, it's a lot different, actually, and in that I decided I was going to do an interview with someone, Dr. Kimberly Jarvis, talking with those of you who are in leadership. And this can be a leadership in your life as well, although we do it in the context of leadership professionally. These same issues show up in life, too. So it's about 30 minutes in length. A very natural and easy conversation between the two of us. Kick back, enjoy yourself, and I'll just simply say, if you're interested in my coaching you, there's information at the end of the show that will tell you how to get in touch with me. But fundamentally, connect with me on LinkedIn at linkedin.com forward slash IN forward slash The Big Game Hunter. Mention that you listen to this. I just like knowing I'm helping some folks. And once we're connected, message me that you're interested in coaching. And with that, let's get going. So my guest today is Dr. Kim Jarvis, who's the CEO and founder of All Career Matters, a consulting firm focused on leadership and team development. She has more than 20 years of experience in career and leadership development coaching and has a passion for helping leaders to increase their effectiveness. She and I are both members of the Forbes Coaches Council, and her career advice has featured let me try that again. Her career advice has been featured in Forbes, Barron, CNBC, and Vogue. Vogue? Fascinating. Kim, welcome. Thank you. Happy to be here. <laughs> so we're going to talk about leadership. And it's almost like we're going to be talking about leadership fails that um, people get involved with and you know, do things to undermine their leadership in their organization. Mm -hmm. um, how did you become interested in this? I'm just curious. You know, I became fascinated with leadership and the impact that they have on people when I had my first horrible boss in high school, actually. Um, I just remember thinking, are you kidding? How does this happen? And why do leaders do what they do? And how can leaders understand the impact that they have on other people, not only at work, but at home and at, you know, in their personal lives? And I've been fascinated by it for my entire career, um, something I've been really passionate about. I went to school, to, you know, for a doctorate in organizational leadership, and, and I've been focused on this for a while. It's definitely my calling. And I think, you know, the biggest question for me is what can I do to impact leaders and help them to be more effective, not only to help them, but all the people who are underneath them and are impacted by their behavior. Fabulous. So when we look at leadership fails, mistakes that leaders make that under, uh, undermine their leadership, there are thousands of them, tens oh, yeah. of thousands, <laughs> but we're going to focus in on a couple. Mm -hmm. um, where should we start? What would you say is 
you know, one of the important ones we should look at? I think a, a really important and common area that impacts leaders credibility and also undermines um, morale and decreases morale within teams is around supervising, either over supervising or under supervising. So, I, you know, it's funny you say over and under, mm-hmm. like it's the three bears approach to leadership. Right. You know, how do you figure out what's exactly right? Like, first of all, what is over supervising like? Is that the, you know, the micromanagement mm-hmm. scenarios? Yeah, so over-supervising is really common, something that a lot of people talk about very frequently when they talk about leadership styles that drive them nuts is micromanagement, um, which is basically offering someone more support or direction than they need for that task. So if you have somebody who's good at a particular project or task, all they really need from you is very clear expectations about expected outcomes. What do you hope the end result looks like? And then just get out of their way, right? But so many leaders end up providing feedback all along the way. They tell them not only the what needs to be accomplished, but how to accomplish it step by step. And, and that can be really undermining and also decrease morale. It almost reminds me of being overly parental. Yes, right. Like and ultra soccer mom. <laughs> <laughs> Helicopter mom. Yes. Mom to the rescue. Dad who wants to. dads. Make, right. right. You know, dads who want to make sure the kid doesn't break. Mm-hmm. Exactly. All that kind of stuff. And then there's the underside. Right. I don't think enough people talk about it. How does, I, how does that I, show? Yeah, and I don't think they do either. And I've seen this play out pretty regularly as well. So not offering people the support, the guidance, the direction that they need for a task that may be new to them or huge or ambiguous can lead to decreased morale, can lead to actually retention issues, people leaving. Um, so I think I think the the goal is finding out if someone has experience in a particular project or area, asking them what they need from you for that project or area, and knowing that somebody who's new to a job or new to a company or a leader will likely um, overstate their level of confidence and competence in a particular project. So it's important for leaders to really figure out, have you done this before? Walk me through how you would do this and what can I do to support you? And I think that's the key. Just talking to people about, hey, here are your big projects. What do you need from me? What would be helpful? And and that can be really instrumental in leaders, you know, understanding what they need to offer and then you know, definitely need to follow up and offer that kind of support or guidance or whatever it is that they ask for. And then I suspect there's some sort of connection after the, you know, you push the bird out of the nest at that moment Mm -hmm. uh, and then basically have them check in with you periodically, you know, for the status reporting to ensure that they've said they can do this, they said they understand, but are they actually delivering? Exactly. And I think talking about how should we stay in touch and what are the expected outcomes and, you know, that's very important as well. Um, But you just want to avoid as a leader providing too much or too little supervision because it it has an impact in both directions. You betcha it does. So that's the first one. That's the first. uh, It's actually a combined group of mistakes that leaders make. What else Mm -hmm. do they tend to do? You know, I think another thing that I work with leaders on very regularly is um, trying to unravel the mess that's made by not addressing toxic behavior in the workplace. Can we just get the dramatic music around toxic behavior? Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> <laughs> is that good? Is that dramatic enough? Toxic behavior <laughs> in the workplace. <laughs> Your doom <laughs> forever. <laughs> how does that tend to show up? Because I know how it's shown up for me. Where do you tend to see it? Well, I think that what happens is often leaders will ignore really bad behavior or let it let it linger for too long, allowing people to not only witness it on the team but possibly worse mimic it. You know, um, so an example is, and a, and a recent example is somebody 
I, um, somebody who's a very high achieving person starting in a role, super, super competitive. And the way that she accomplishes goals is by steamrolling, basically bulldozing others, right? And it not only impacts her ability to get stuff done, but it's, it's causing trust issues with, with the people that she needs to work with and collaborate with to accomplish goals. And instead, she's competing with them. And so if that isn't addressed by a leader, what happens? People think, oh, it's okay. That's okay behavior. Maybe even that's good behavior. I should also engage in that way. And it undermines the connections and trust that needs need to happen between teams and for direct reports, you know, in effort to get jobs done. Most people can't operate in a competitive, individually focused way in most work environments. And, um, you know, it, it can be really challenging. And um, I'll just share from my own experience. You know, I used to work in search and did it successfully for many years. And I remember being with one firm where there was a guy who was doing tremendous business and he would steal from his colleagues. And we all got the message since there was no intervention by management uh, time and again that this was okay. This was accepted behavior. And the rest of us wound up being in this situation going, this is crazy. And slowly but surely, we get the message that we're not going to be looked out for. Mm -hmm. No one's protecting us. Mm -hmm. I know we lost half the staff at that point. Right. So it's very frustrating. Definitely. And I think if leaders identify toxic behaviors that are not, that are undermining the team's success or not helpful for the individual person and they address it in a timely manner, it's not only helping to decrease mimicking, you know, to decrease those trust issues that you, you brought up, but it's also helping to increase their credibility as a leader and to be seen as a credible um, person who can, who can have difficult conversations to support the team. Yeah, and it just undermines the leadership in that group, that division, in that organization. And people just learn, you know, we, mm-hmm. it's not a safe place to work. And folks, these days, you know, it's pretty clear, you know, there are lots of ways your employees have to communicate your bad behavior. Right. <laughs> You can't avoid this anymore. You can't blame it on, uh, you know, gossip in the restrooms between one, you know, from within one gender or another. It's Mm -hmm. online (laughs) perpetually and it will make it hard for you to recruit people. Exactly. So what else do they do? Ha ha ha. Um, You know, one of the things that I think is also really common is not clarifying expectations. So what does this job look like? What does this project look like? How do we know that you're successful? How do we measure success at the end? Let's make sure that we're super clear about that. It's often really ambiguous and then, you know, becomes a surprise when that, when that project or that particular role is evaluated, whether that's a, during an annual performance review or whether that's after, you know, a rollout of, a, of a, an event or, or a product. So being very clear about expected outcomes is one of the most supportive things that leaders can do to help their team members. I know an interview prep Uh, because I also coach around job search. Uh, I talk to people about questions that they should ask. And there's two questions I encourage them to ask. One is uh, about the first 30, 60, 90 days and what their expectations are going to be. And then, you know, in effect, to talk with them about the first review at the one-year mark and what success will look Mm -hmm. like there, knowing that they were a great hire and they were so smart to hire them. And they are now thrilled a year later. So what will success look like then? And it's amazing when I hear the stories about the bar having been moved on the one-year performance and people pause and go, but you told me at the interview that this is what you were looking for mm-hmm. and never communicated to change. Yeah. How crazy making is that? Well, and it, I think it really undermines trust and, and it's just, it's confusing and, and people don't know what they're shooting for. And it's, it's not a fair situation to put people in when they don't know exactly 
what success looks like and what the expectations are, or if they constantly move, like you said, it's a moving target. It's like a psychological game right there, you know, not fun for anyone. So I think as being as clear as you can, knowing that organizations change, they have to, you know, teams and individuals have to adapt sometimes really rapidly and quickly to changing situations at work. But as, as often as you can be clear about those expectations, the more helpful it will be. And I encourage people that I coach, um, you know, who are leaders who are in career transition to find out as quickly as they can, what, what does success look like? And how can we make sure that we can measure that, you know, um, in the beginning of their jobs, like you're talking about, because I think that's a very important start. Employees can influence this and encourage it by, making sure that they're asking the right questions. I've asked, you know, I want to, I want to get exceeds expectations and I need to know what that looks like from you. I've asked that of a boss and guess what? I got exceeds expectations. I mean, I had clear because I asked, not because, you know, it was offered to me, but because I asked, I had very clear idea of what is expected and what exceeds expectations looks like. And, and I received that evaluation. Super. And so often, folks, you're in situations where, you know, you're at the six month mark and your boss walks in and says, I'm leaving. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's so important at the time your new one takes over that you speak with she or he and talk with them about what their expectations of you are going to be. And of course, the first going to talk about learning the lay of the land and understanding what your capabilities are. And you have to accept that part. But as soon as you can, you want to understand how they're going to measure success because they're six months away from giving you a review. Right. Exactly. And that's one of those real life scenarios that tends not to be addressed. Your boss leaves and sometimes it's not at the six month mark, it's at the 10 month mark. Right. Or 12. Yeah. Or 12. <laughs> and someone who doesn't know you at all is doing your performance review. Blind. You know, it's a possibility. So note taking over the course of the year will help you a lot to head off these situations where you just on a monthly or quarterly basis dictate or jot down some notes what your successes look like over the course of that period of time. So this way, if you deal with one of those God forbid situations, you can address it. It's really that simple. And you're not just formulating stuff last minute and freaking out over it. This is sweet stuff. What else do people do that undermines their leadership and creates um, distrust, hazard, and other sorts of problems for themselves? Uh, another big one is focusing on development areas instead of focusing on strengths of people on the team. How does that show up? Tell me about that. So this is very common, and although a lot of research has proven it's really ineffective, um, it is still commonly used by leaders as a way to motivate people to change their behavior. Um, so think about your own motivation. Are you motivated? Have you ever worked with someone who pointed out everything you do wrong? And is that motivating? Um, or... Folks, you can't, see, you can't see this, but I had this smug look on my face that said, hell yeah, I worked <laughs> in search for a long time. Owners, even myself to myself, pick apart mistakes all the time. There's no mm -hmm. praise. Faint praise is at best. Mm -hmm. No praise, just perpetual criticism is common. I'm sorry to interrupt. No. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no problem. Um, but if you're like most people, right, you prefer to hear a balanced approach. Not all what you're doing well, but, you know, it, it's much more motivating and encouraging to hear what's going well, right, than to just hear what you need to improve. So what I recommend leaders do is catch them doing things right and share feedback with them timely, quickly. Um, and focus on that, you know, find people doing things right, encouraging that behavior. Um, you can do that publicly for most people. You may want to check with your team and make sure they're comfortable with that. But most people are like, heck, yeah, you can share with the, the you know, the, at the stand up meeting or whatever that I did a great job. Um, but you should definitely strive for if you're sharing three positive pieces of feedback for every one constructive criticism. 
that opens people up knowing that, you know, and, and establishing a feeling of trust. And then they're much more likely to be able to hear the constructive feedback when it comes. If you only offer constructive feedback, and I've worked for a leader like this um, personally, and I've seen the impact in coach leaders who are focused on that, um, it, you eventually, people eventually just shut down. They can't hear it's like a garage door closing. Um, they cannot hear that constructive feedback. They're trying to protect themselves from the onslaught. But if you offer, you know, a much more balanced and highly, you know, actually more geared towards the positive feedback, catching people what they're doing well more often than constructive, they will be much more able to understand that you have their back and willing to listen and, and act on that feedback. It reminds me of the Ken Blanchard one minute manager idea. Yes. Catch them doing something right. Right. And not just always catch them doing something wrong. Right. I, I also remember in Toastmasters, um, when people receive feedback on the public speaking, they use a sandwich approach. Mm-hmm. And there's, you know, praise, you know, acknowledgement for some, something that they did well. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, the rough edge, you know, the area of improvement, that from a time standpoint would be less than the first amount of praise, and then there's more praise at the end. So you sandwich the, uh, uh, the challenge area, the suggested improvement around the praise, and you have a shot at being heard. And, and I know from experience in situations where uh, I've supervised people, I've led organizations, you know, the notion that you can just walk in and praise people all the time, they stop listening because they know that they're not doing well. If you don't believe mm-hmm. me, try with your kids all the time. Oh, you're, you're so wonderful. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> they stop listening. Right. And we're just kids who are disguised in better clothing. Mary, we are. Yes. And, you know, the, the caution with the sandwich approach that you talked about is yes. sometimes it softens the constructive feedback so much that people don't hear it. So it's, and you don't always have to, you know, um, offer positive feedback before giving constructive feedback necessarily. I think just the balance is really important. So the number of times you give someone, you know, positive feedback versus constructive is important to focus on because you want to make sure that they definitely hear the message when they need to make a change or improve something. Um, you don't want to soften it so much that it's, it's hard to remember that or hear that. Um, but you don't want to be a morale killer either. Right. And in a situation like that, where you're offering constructive feedback, as well as some praise, would you suggest that someone follow up by saying, I just want to make sure you got my message right? Overall, Mm -hmm. terrific work. Mm -hmm. And what did I suggest in terms of areas of improvement here or or something that you might have done a little bit differently? Would you go that far or just assume that the adult in the room had heard it? You know, I think that's a really good idea. And even saying, what do you plan to do? What are your next steps to kind of address this feedback might be another way of getting, getting, knowing that they understand the message that you're trying to convey. Sweet. Feels like we've covered four so far. Is there more? (laughs) There's always more. Um, (laughs) (laughs) That was perfect. I, another big one is around feedback. So it piggybacks on, you know, focusing on development opportunities instead of strengths, but it's, it's broader. So a lot of what I've seen leaders do is um, things that undermine their credibility, like sharing constructive feedback in front of other people, you know, to an individual person, but in front of a room of people or a couple people even that usually does not work very well. Probably depends on the culture of the team and the individual people involved, but I normally would recommend if you have constructive feedback to share, do that one-on-one. And if the team needs to know about the outcome of that conversation, you can update the team together and say, we talked about this and here's where we are. That's fine. But always err on the side of doing that in private. Um, so, many, so many managers and coaches in sports, mm-hmm. you know, they go out in front of the cameras after the game, and you never hear them say anything about a specific player. Mm-hmm. You only hear them talk about, you know, we, today we didn't show up. It was one of these, and to call someone a, a, a quitter 
Well, the team a quitter, ooh, that's the ultimate you know, curse or insult that you might use. Mm-hmm. But the notion of you know, con- quote-unquote constructive feedback, a.k.a. criticism, mm-hmm. invariably can be heard harshly. And doing that in public, ooh, that's way too painful for people. And as a leader in your organization, man, you're going to lose them fast. Mm -hmm. I ask people in my Facebook group to weigh in on this. Like, what are the big morale killing behaviors that you've identified? And, And one of the things that came up was leaders leading groups and then kind of, you know, tearing apart someone's work after, you know, each week in front of the group. I've, I've actually worked in an environment like that myself. It's, not fun, you know, where we would talk about, got to put on our armor, we're presenting our work in front of the team, got to get ready, you know, for the, you know, for the onslaught of uh, what we did wrong, which was very encouraged in that particular environment. And actually, probably uh, that environment had the lowest retention I've ever witnessed in my professional career, not surprisingly. And and you kind of remind me about situations in sales where there's the sales meeting and Mm -hmm. and the entire sales organization gets together. And sometimes they're broken up into smaller groups. Mm -hmm. And the notion is around self-coaching and self-mentoring. And people will come out and say, these are the successes I had this year. This is where I didn't quite do as well. How might you approach it differently? Can I get some input from you? And then they lay out their goals for the next year. Could that work or is that something that would be taboo in your thinking? Well, I think that sounds very constructive. It's like, here's what I think went well, here's where I think I could improve and getting feedback from other people. Um, I think when it can be really destructive is if it's, very personal Mm -hmm. to that person and it doesn't impact other people on the team and it's you know and it's uh it and if if the feedback can be hurtful or hard to hear just just do it one-on-one there's no point right you're it's it's not going to help the team's trust if you you know, if you do that in a group setting. But if it's more like, hey, here's where I am in sales. This is where I think I could do better. Anyone have any ideas about how I can improve? That, that sounds really different to me. Look, the, the, you know, the sales situation where I approached it this way mm-hmm. and the deal blew up. Mm-hmm. Uh, what, do you have any ideas of how I might be, have done it differently? Right. Because I'm trying to learn from you because you folks are in the same boat as I am. Uh, and it's different when someone asks for feedback than if they receive receive unsolicited feedback, right? Yeah. There's a difference there. I know in sales meetings, you may be forced to ask for feedback. It may not be a voluntary thing necessarily, but, um, but that's another thing I really encourage individuals to do is to consistently ask for feedback so that they hear it because people often feel so uncomfortable sharing unsolicited feedback, even leaders. And I, I, another piece of ineffective feedback that I've noticed is avoiding sharing constructive feedback because you're afraid you're going to hurt someone's feelings. But I've seen it to the point where leaders avoid it and then they're getting ready to fire someone for engaging in this behavior, but haven't yet had the conversation with the individual about the behavior that's holding them back. Oh, that's awful. That and that's not fair. Right. That's not fair either, right? Yeah. Obviously. And there's someone I'm coaching who's in a, who runs a sales organization with a tech firm, and you know he had a, uh, he took over this group, had a few headaches in the group, and this was one of his supportive people. And now it's a year later, the headaches are gone, and one of his supportive people is way underperforming. Mm-hmm. He's been doing it for half a year, and now he's got to put them on the plan. Mm-hmm. You know the you know the plan that basically gives them ninety days to turn things around. Right, and you know he's in a lot of agony about this because although he's spoken with him previously about his performance or lack thereof, he now has to formalize everything and encourage the guy. It's now or never for the next mm-hmm. ninety days to turn it around. 
that giving folks the opportunity to be self-corrective or mm-hmm. with support correct the failures has to be the way to go. And right. Not to simply drop a bomb on someone's head. Exactly. And a lot of leaders avoid those conversations because they're afraid to hurt their feelings. But what's more hurtful for a person? Being fired. Right. Being <laughs> fired or, um, or even just doing things that are getting in their own way and not even knowing about it, maybe having it be a blind spot for them. That's much more hurtful than sitting down and saying, hey, you know, one of the things I've noticed is... Um, you're engaging in this behavior and I think that it could be more effective if you do X, you know, is, is a lot nicer than not having the conversation. You betcha. You betcha. Have we covered five or six things so far? I think five. Is there another? Is there a bonus round? There is a bonus number Mm -hmm. six. Um, And that is leaders not listening. What'd you say? I'm sorry. (laughs) Walk right back into that one. (laughs) And it was such a cheap joke. It really was. And it worked. I was going to answer your question. Um, So I think leaders need to think about, you know, do you listen to understand people's perspectives before you share your own? Um, You know, are you asking open-ended questions to learn more about the situation Or do you tend to dive into like action mode and try to offer solutions? You know, most people will will come to their supervisors with situations that they just need to process and talk through. And they're not necessarily asking leaders to fix the problem, but um, but want them to understand the situation and, you know, give them feedback on their their approach to solving the problem. If your team feels heard by you, their trust and perception of your leadership credibility will definitely grow as a result. So the classic scenario is someone comes into their managers, directors, whatever the title is, office. Mm -hmm. I've got a situation I'm working with. I'd appreciate some input. So they're being clear. They're asking for input. Mm -hmm. They're not asking to have the problem solved. Mm -hmm. Uh, So often there's the problem solving the response versus the Q&A response because you're only getting, what, a minute of information and you're going to make a decision based upon 60 seconds of data? Right. Exactly. Of incomplete data. Mm-hmm. That make a lot of sense to you because it sure doesn't to me. No. So we've got six things that folks do that undermine their leadership. Do you, do you remember them sufficiently to give us a quick recap? Absolutely. So I would say... Thank you just for the outline you have. <laughs> <laughs> over or under supervising is one. Consistently allowing toxic behavior. I've got to say it with a doom voice. Um, not clarifying expectations and, and clear measures of success. Focusing on development areas over strengths. Um, just offering ineffective feedback. We talked about many different aspects of that. Surprising feedback, constructive feedback in front of others um, or in a group setting, avoiding constructive feedback to, in an effort to not hurt someone's feelings. And then we talked about not listening. Thank you. Dr. Jarvis, how can folks reach you and find out more about you and your work? A great place to go is my website, um, allcareermatters, with an S, dot com. I heard a Facebook group. What is that all about? I do have a face group, a Facebook group at All Career Matters as well. Yeah, either one of those would be a great place to reach me. That is super. Hey, thanks for making time today. I really appreciate it. So that's today's show. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, subscribe in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, wherever you listen to the show. Just subscribe so you get downloads whenever I release a new episode. Each show is going to be bite-sized morsels of advice just like today's. I hope you enjoyed it, and I do hope you subscribe. And if you do choose to subscribe, I hope you decide to support the show. There's a link that will take you to anchor.fm where you can make a pledge in support of the show. I'd greatly appreciate it. If you're interested in my coaching you, connect with me on LinkedIn 
at linkedin.com forward slash IN forward slash the big game hunter. Mention that you listen to the show. I just happen to like knowing I'm helping some folks. And once we're connected, message me about your interest in, in coaching. We'll set up a free call. We'll get acquainted. See if it makes sense. I'll be back soon with more. And in the meantime, I hope you have a great day. Take care. Time for the